Hello everyone, it's Mr. Ferreira here to try and talk you through another set of slides relating to addiction. Now, what I need to reassure you about is that what we've been exploring is our understanding of what is addiction and kind of what makes us study it. It's an applied course, so in other words, we take our understanding of psychology and we try and apply it to a particular topic. In this particular topic, of course, it's addiction. So this short slide, sets of slides, are about what I've just loosely labeled the history of, it, of the addiction specification. In the old spec, we made a big deal about going through what we call the models of addiction. And in fact, about half of the actual content was focusing on these models and how they explain specific addictions. For your course, what is really good is they realize that this was way too detailed and, and wasn't necessary. But if we do understand that each of our understandings that we can get for addiction will come from these models. And so therefore for you, what is appropriate is that it links to the approaches topic. Now, the first model um, that we explored in the old spec was something called the biological model. Now, this is obviously something which you really are familiar with. We often call this the disease model. And of course, what we have here is that addiction is a specific diagnosis. So you actually get diagnosed with this illness called addiction. Now, that does mean that you will always have the addiction. So we see the word here, irreversible. Okay, So once an addict, always an addict. Okay, Because of the illness that you have. Now, also the other thing we could say is that the problem lies within individual. Now, this is significant because it's it kind of takes us away from societal problems and says, no, some people are addicts and other people are not. But I suppose in one way uh, that something which is good is, of course, it's this emphasis on treatment. And so we find in this particular model, we have lots of ways of kind of treating an addict by giving them substances to help them with the addiction. Now, the model in itself is fairly straightforward. I think many of you will enjoy the biological aspect of addiction. You'll see how drugs and behaviours can stimulate the brain um, and, of course, uh, reward you. So, therefore, because of this, we find this idea, we can use this phrase, initiation, which says that the moment I kind of take a drug or the moment I kind of um, habitually get into a particular behavior, then of course I have um, the reward process happening to me. So therefore we can also use another word, this idea of predisposition. So in other words, if I am a type of person that say smoking, for example, just takes a hold of me or drinking or, or other forms of stimulants, then I may be predisposed towards that addiction. And we don't need to know much about each of the models, so none of them are going to be detailed. But of course, um, the biological model for me can be quite interesting. And I have two helpful websites that will help you to try and understand addiction. Um, they could help you with the other subjects. They could just be useful within psychology. Now, the first one is going to actually be the Genes to Cognition website. Now, if you are using a Mac, you might need to uh, do something with your Flash bra browser or use a different um, browser like Chrome or something like that before to work. Now, we will use this website for two particular reasons. The main one is mostly going to be something like this, the 3D brain, okay? Because um, I could never draw a brain for you. I could never kind of make it as, you know, as significant um, as, as you'd like it to be. So having a look at the 3D brain. I also believe at some stage there was an iPad app for this that could be quite useful. And we can have different labels of the brain and things like that. Now, of course, what it means is when perhaps you talk reading something and you see, ah, oh, it affects, affects the amygdala, you can actually kind of find kind of whereabouts, um, whereabout exactly is this. 
um, and we see the amygdala is those two spots there. So very, very useful thing that we can use this particular website for. Now this website has also got another function which you might want to find quite useful. Um, you can just type in a topic. So I could type in addiction and we'll have a whole host of different videos and articles which you can read. Um, what I like about this is that it might have boring videos like this. And we find that they transcribe the entire video. It's a very complicated um, addiction to the drug use it for things like that. Now of course you might want to type in other topics there and you'll see that this whole genes to cognition which is um, an organization trying to kind of map the whole brain um, could be very useful for, for you. Now the other um, website that I think you might like in terms of biological model is this um, website that comes from um, one of the universities. Now once again it's the detail that I can't particularly give you, the, the diagrams that we can that they can draw um, that I can't do. And we see there's lots of general, general topics. The ones that I actually found more useful um, is this one called Mouse Party. Um, see, problem with with uh, Flash there. Um, I don't know if you can actually hear the sound. I certainly can. Um, and the, the, all the mice are uh, exciting. Um, bizarre. I'm not going to mention what they look like, but uh, what you might find more interesting is that if you have a particular interest in a particular drug, but like the first video that I showed, uh, that I, uh, showed you, you can find a particular um, addiction, so heroin, um, ecstasy, you know, um, cannabis, you can actually just do your mouse. And uh, put them in the chair. And it goes through a series of information about the drug. Serotonin that's transporters are responsible for cat. removing serotonin molecules okay. from the synaptic cloud. Okay, so please explore both those websites as best as you can. Now, we're moving on to the next particular model. Now, the next model that we look at um, quite heavily is the cognitive model of addiction. Now, we'll see that for the specific addictions we look at, we look at the biological model, the cognitive model, and the learning model. And the cognitive model, of course, is this understanding that any of our thoughts, attitudes, or beliefs about the world are are kind of what our co cognitions are. So therefore, we can say in terms of addiction, it's these cognitions that maybe force the habit of the addictive substance or interpreting events in a particular way. Now, they also use this word here called maintenance, okay? Now, you could argue that you can use this both for maintenance and initiation, but what I mean by maintenance is that these cognitions keep on reoccurring and kind of keep the habit going rather than kind of making me go, oh, I, sh I shouldn't do this. A classic example would be uh, gambling addiction. So in gambling addiction, we find that perhaps uh, the, the loss, kind of the lack of reward potentially in the gambling behavior should very simply and very easily um, make me stop. But of course, I can have these faulty cognitions that keep me gambling for longer and longer and longer. Yeah, some of the premises that we find here is that um, obviously the cognitions that the addictive behavior will be changed, uh, will change the mood. So for example, if I'm feeling low, I can take something that can make me feel better. Or if I'm feeling scared, I can take something that can take that feel away from me. Okay. Now, of course, what we find is that vicious circle. Okay, so I feel low. I have these cognitions or thoughts that makes me do something about it. That makes escalates the problem even even worse. And therefore, I continue on to make some bad decisions and learn how to get rid of those um, those bad things that are happening to me.
Okay, so the cognitive model um, will also be linked to things like self-medication. So, of course, I choose particular behaviour to make myself feel better. Now, the last model that I'm going to mention is the learning model. Now, of course, this is the behaviourist approach. And I think some of you might be thinking, well, hang on, surely learning addictive behaviour, how can somebody who is passed out in the gutter somewhere have simply have learnt the particular behaviour? Now, what I would like you to think about in terms of learning is how compelling it can be. And that's the habit forming. Also, maybe link this to things like trauma. So... I learn that certain things can help me with my trauma, help me with the, the feelings that I might have. Now, I have quite a compelling example of my, my dad's smoking. Now, he started smoking when he was incredibly young, probably about uh, 11, 12. Um, he is or was from a family of seven siblings. And I do believe, I never met my grandparents, but I do believe that my grandfather smoked. So he's got six brothers and sisters smoking, he's got a, a parent who smokes, and so of course he's introduced to smoking at a very young age. Okay, furthermore, we have the situation where he then also, at a very young age, of about 14, 15, he is forced to leave school and he has to go and get a job. So he gets a job working in the railways. Now, what was very significant about this was a lot of it was quite structured. He had a very structured program. He'd wake up in the morning, he'd do one thing, move on to the next thing, he'd walk to work, he'd do things like that, okay? But at work, probably more importantly in terms of smoking, is that they had a smoke break of 15 minutes in the morning and in the afternoon. Now, the key to this, of course, is if you didn't smoke, you didn't get the smoke break. So, of course, once again, quite compelling reasons to join everyone else in smoking. Now, of course, he could have just had a biological cognitive reason for smoking. But what makes me think that his behaviour was quite learned is that when he got to a point where smoking was problematic for him, and the problem for him was actually the cost of smoking, he had very low income and therefore could not afford to buy cigarettes. He was able to work through his reasoning, his understanding of kind of needing to give up, and he gave up almost overnight. In fact, it was overnight. Um, he gave up and he never turned back. Okay. Now, of course, there are other elements to this as well. Um, kind of once he had given up, there were other rewards. One of the things that he spoke about was, t was his taste returning. And we find that actually, despite kind of how difficult smoking is to give up, he was able to give up quite easily. Okay, I do believe that he perhaps had learned the behaviour and when he was able to unlearn the behaviour, he kind of gave up. Now, you might not be convinced by this, but when I see you kind of face to face, we can talk about it in a bit more detail. Now, of course, what we find with the learning model, the things that I like about it are things like this, is of course we can use things like social learning. So we have somebody who is hanging out with a group of people who are perhaps smoking or hanging out in the park, smoking cannabis, that it's that kind of the peer kind of pressure type, type idea. Or if you grow up in a family that are smokers or, or, or something like that, it seems to be quite kind of logical. I also like the fact that it can be unlearned. It's one of the few models that actually kind of says that, well, when you have unlearned this, you're no longer an addict, you're better, you don't have any form of, of, of addiction, which I quite like. So in relation to that, the biological model, as I said, is, is perhaps all or nothing. You have this disease, therefore you are sick. Now in this particular situation, you could have degrees of how much of a habit has it become. Okay, so for example, some people might regard themselves only as being social smokers. Now the biological model could not explain that. Okay, so in terms of learned behaviour, you've learned that when you're out with your friends having a couple of pints, that smoking seems to be appropriate. And of course, what is important here is that it's the behaviour is no different from any other behaviour. So there we have, we have gone through very quickly the different models that we have for addiction. Now, of course, this is not different from some of the other things that I've said. It's just a bit more clarity as to the history of where we have come from the old spec. 
now most importantly when we come to the new spec when we actually start the content that is specific for the course we'll see that the, that the addictions that they want us to look at of smoking and gambling are linked to the learning the biological and the cognitive models now if you read up on these of course 